Hello. Welcome back. Episode 247 of the House of Butafuoco. Okay, no. It's just me, Todd Hexpress. Nice to see you again. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I don't think I have any programming notes. Just hope everyone's having a good week. Today, we're here to look at the low-level system agnostic OSR adventure called the Black Worm of Brandonsford. Words, map, and pictures by Chance Dudenak. I don't recall where I heard of this one, but I got it recently. Thought it would be a good one to take a look at. I think I heard good things about it. It's fairly new. I think it was published. Well, according to the PDF, which I will get handy here in a sec, published in 2020. There is a link to it on uh, drive through where I picked this up in the show notes. Let me flick the switch to bring it on screen. But I'm bam bam. Sorry for folks listening to this later that you won't notice any change to your audio stream as the as I both adjust my right now wonky dime store reading glasses and pull up the PDF, but there it is. This, ladies and gentlemen, is riveting video content. Riveting video content. And then my cat's trying to escape and looks like she just did. I try to leave the door open from this room a little bit so she can get out without making too much noises. And she's smarter. My other cat, which I love, Bruce, he I haven't really gotten the opening the door thing figured out, but she she has. She's she's a bit more. Uh, I, I guess uh, what's the word? She's she's a bit more clever in that manner than he is. Sorry, Bruce. It's it's true. Maybe because you've been taking care of so much, you're just meow at people to open the door. Betty actually does it. All right, let's get to the book. Enough about me and my cats. Let's get to the book. First up, we get a really nice map. It's got a scale, but without a grid or hexes or anything. I guess we just have to kind of take their word for it. So one inch, it's about half a mile. I'm guessing this isn't printed out. It would be an eight and a half by 11 page. So we're looking at maybe half an inch margins on either side. So something like... Let's see if it's uh, eight and a half by 11, so say maybe 10 inches, so about five miles vertically and four and a half miles, something like that, horizontally. Several locations with a river running through it. No, not that river, Brad Pitt. This is a totally different river. In the so the river runs a little bit of an S curve through the center of the map, starting in the southwestern corner and exiting in the northeastern corner, or perhaps it is flowing from northeast to southwest. Maybe that's a better way to say it. And then on the eastern side of the river, but at that southwestern edge, is a walled town of Brandonsford. And we have multiple other locations in the wilderness. It's a lot of a lot of forest areas, and then some mountains along the northern edge. And the dragon's lair is up in that northern edge on the northeastern corner. And then between the town and the dragon's lair, we've got areas marked as Fawn's Grove, a witch of the woods, a giant's house, a destroyed caravan, a goblin castle, a barrel mound, a dwarven mine, and finally the lair of the dragon, but it's a nice map. I like it. Simple communicates what needs to communicate. Like I said, the only thing if I was going to ding it at all would just be, a, I wouldn't mind having a grid or a hex or some kind of overlay to make, make measuring a little bit easier, you know, uh, prevent me from having to go dig up a ruler if I'm trying to figure things out. No roads at all. I noticed it seems like most of the locations are, Isolated, so potentially no road. No, there wouldn't be any paths leading, for example, from Brandonsford to the Witch of the Woods. But I don't see any roads leading to Brandonsford from anywhere else. Presumably, we would add those in ourselves. 
but it definitely at this point, Brandonsford would seem to be the lone outpost of settlement in this entire area. Let's move along. Next week in introduction, I'll read, I'm not sure how much of everything I will read. I probably won't read a hundred percent, but I'll try to read what I think is important. So I will read the overview paragraph. This module is designed for play using the BX rule set and can be used in similar old school systems with minimal conversion. It is meant to be run with a party of four to eight characters of first to third level. The party should be encouraged to investigate their surroundings, practice caution, caution, retreat if necessary, and think of clever solutions to deal with obstacles. All right, so great. So BX, essentially, for a good, strong party of four to eight brave souls from first to third level. We don't know if that's including hirelings or not, but no matter. Given the usual OSR advice of, hey, investigate, be cautious, retreat if you need to, think of clever ways to get around stuff. Now we get a, a, a section on GM background. The Tale of Sir Brandon. Hundreds of years ago, a dragon terrorized the village of a young warrior called Brandon. Brandon gathered a company of brave heroes, and together they ventured into the wilds to slay the beast. There, Brandon received a magical sword from a beautiful fairy, which he used to kill the dragon. Gets a little bit more light in here. Oops. Okay, Brandon and his men were knighted for their deeds, and in time the village became known as Brandonsford for the hero. All right, so there we have a little bit of a history of Brandonsford, the place. And then we get a little bit more about Brandonsford, a quiet little town at the edge of the wilderness. The houses here are mostly thatched roof stone cottages, along with two plaster and timber inns, all herded together by an ancient stone wall. There are no guards or proper law enforcement, but the town is protected by a rotating group of able-bodied men on night watch duty. The Dragon. A family of dwarven brothers once lived in a cottage in the woods, leading simple lives, mining under a hill. That is, until they came across a stash of buried treasure several weeks ago. One of the dwarves became so consumed by his greed that he killed his brothers to take it all for himself. His terrible greed transformed him into a dragon. The fearsome dragon terrorized the townspeople and slaughtered all but one of the hunters sent to kill it. Now no one in Brandonsford dares leave the town's walls. So this element I like a lot. I've mentioned in the past, though maybe not recently, that I've been listening to the very extremely detailed Lord of the Rings podcast by the Mythgard Academy. And, and in some of the episodes past, they've talked about the concept that Tolkien used in the Hobbit and a little bit in Lord of the Rings, which is dragon sickness or gold sickness, which I've been trying to figure out how I can use into my games, which essentially it's that the act of hoarding treasure becomes its own sort of consumes the person who's doing it. If you've read The Hobbit, you could think of Thorin with the Arkenstone as being overcome by dragon sickness and other characters who might be in, become afflicted with that. This, to me, is, is, a, is an outgrowth of that same concept, only now, instead of becoming dragon-like in the fact of gathering a horde of treasure, the victim has literally become a dragon. So it's very cool because I was wondering, well, how do you get from this to a dragon? Well, here it makes perfect sense. So I kind of like that what this is saying about this, if we want to say the implied setting of this adventure, that if you become greedy enough, you might turn into a dragon, which would be interesting if that was something that we could mechanize for the players. Because if you are have players who might think to just hoard all their gold, here maybe is a somewhat of a cautionary tale against that impulse you might not be able to let go of that gold once you've hoarded it. And not only that, such hoardings might actually turn you into a dragon. You failed your save, whatever you want to call it, versus dragon sickness, and you become transformed. Fairies. While the woods outside Brandon's Fern have always been home to a few of the fair folk, the appearance of the dragon has allowed the fairies to reclaim the forest as their own. One fairy in particular, the Goblin King Hogboon, seeks to take over the forest as his new kingdom. The king has sent his goblin soldiers through the woods to establish control. This has mostly resulted in the annoyance of other forest dwellers and many dead goblins. It's 
We have goblins, we have the dragon, we have Brandonsford, and then we have a little bit of backstory of the tale of Sir Brandon. We next get some adventure hooks. And that's my cat, Betty, if you can hear it. Hey, Terrence. I love fairy tale stuff like that. Yep. Which thing were you thinking about stealing? The the dragon sickness concept or the goblin, the fairy goblin trying to fill the power vacuum? I mean, they're both good ideas. So we have some adventure hooks. First one, while relaxing in their favorite ta tavern, the characters overheard another adventuring party talking about a dragon attacking the people of Brandonsford. And where there's a dragon, there's bound to be boatloads of gold. After a night of high stakes gambling with the local out, with the local out, after a night of high stakes gambling, the party members party members won what he claimed was a an in a genuine pirate's treasure map. Following the map has led the adventurers to Brandonsford with the treasure map treasure buried in the woods nearby, aka the dwarf's mine. That's a little bit. I, I'm not generally one who likes to put the, I don't know, the local uh, patois and try to spell it out. I just find it makes for confusing reading, you, you know, so I know that they have in quotes, gen U I N spelled out gen dash Y O O dash I N E so that you kind of go a gen U I N, you know, something like that. But it just, just say genuine. You can put it in quotes since we, you know maybe we don't want to be certain that it is a genuine pirate's treasure map, uh, you know. But it is, uh, and it doesn't really have to be pirates either. I'm not sure that. Granted, not that pirates can't bury the treasure wherever the heck they want to, but this feels like a pretty inland spot for pirates to be tromping with chests of treasure. And of course, in a fantasy setting, all kinds of folks are finding treasure and needing to keep it. So. It could just be a treasure map, which is a nice old school thing. And then the last of these three adventure hooks, the desperate Reeve of Brandonsford has humbly requested that you hunt and kill the dragon haunting his town for a payment of 1000 gold pieces. So basically we have three adventure hooks. One is you overhear essentially a rumor. The second one is you get a treasure map. And the third one is essentially a quest giver just comes and says, Hey, I'll pay you. X amount of money to get the dragon. And you can pick or choose whichever thing you think will work for your party. We also get some rumors. I guess these are rumors you would hear in Brandonsford. I won't read them, but we have eight rumors that we could probably do. Some of them, they are marked. Some of them are true. Some of them are false. Let's see. See, it looks like at least one of the false ones is partly true, which I like. That would be number three. A witch lives in the woods, which is true, who can turn you into a shrub just by looking at you, which is false. The only one that's fully false is that the dragon doesn't exist. It's merely an illusion conjured up by those wicked fairies. That, of course, is not true. And then one is marked partially true which is the town's alchemist cavorts with an evil witch who lives deep in the forest. But this part, they didn't say which part is true or false. So that's, I, I, that's, yeah, I don't know. It's a little bit inconsistent in the way it's set up because there's one that's marked as false, yet part of it is true, which is the first part, a witch lives in the woods. Then one that's marked partially true, but doesn't, doesn't tell you as the GM which one and which part is true and which part is false. Is it the fact that there's an evil witch who lives in the wood deep in the forest? Is it the fact that it's a witch who lives in the forest who's not evil? Is it that the town's alchemist cavorts? There's a few different would be nice to know since the other ones are broken out, true or false. Why not break out which part of the which part of that is true, which part of that is false? All right, but we do get some rumors. So we got rumors, always like rumors. We get a section here on the town of Brensford with some notable NPCs. Bentley, owner of the Clumsy Fox Tavern. Has a couple, he's a halfling, has a couple of bullet points. He's got a famous foxtail brew. He's got rooms for rent. And if you are in the tavern, we've got some hirelings 
or retainers, whatever you want to call them, that you can recruit, which I like that they give you some with names and their classes and, and stats and everything, which is a nice touch. You could hire Lady Hilda, who's a lawful fighter of second level. Malz, Malzazarek the Magnificent, a neutral magic user, also second level. Drop Dead Ned, a chaotic thief of level two as well. And then a halfling neutral, also level two, name of Squints. That's cool. I, I, I like that. I'm not going to go through all their stats, but it's nice that they have some, hey, here's some hirelings that you can just throw in there that can be sitting there drinking in the tavern if and when your party wants to come in and recruit some folks, or at least the first time they do. Who knows how many forays they'll make and how many of those guys will not will drop dead before they get back to town, but at least you have a, a starting roster. Another notable NPC is Quinn, owner of the Golden Egg Tavern. Let's see. Does not not seem to be quite as good a place as the Clumsy Fox. They sell water down swill. He does have a little side quest to for 100 gold pieces to catch whoever's been stealing from a seller. Uh, who's Bentley? Oh, he thinks that he thinks that Bentley, who owns the Clumsy Fox, is a thief, or that he hired the thief. He keeps buying great booze, but it keeps disappearing. But the real cause of the disappearance is a clericon who sneaks into his cellar every night. I'm not sure what a clericon is, but we can see that on page seven. So we have a little bit of a side quest. Presumably, if for some reason they just want an extra hundred gold pieces, they can, I'm, I'm guessing, stake out the tavern and notice this clericon who's sneaking in and stealing all the good booze. We also have Cedric, the general store clerk. He has a list of things that they sell, and we'll talk about how his supply shipments haven't been coming in since the troubles with the dragon, dragon began. So depending on how the party, how the party's made their way to Brandonsford and what their situation is, they might be able to even potentially get another, some more reward. Maybe they can wheedle some more reward out of Cedric. And then we also have Eric, the town Reeve. He's offering a thousand gold pieces to kill the dragon. Also believes the witch living in the woods is responsible for all their problems. Don't blame the witch. We've got Warwick the Smith. I do appreciate these bullet points. So they have a, a little bit description of the Smith shop. We get what they sell. We have the problem that the Smith, ha Smith has, something that they offer. And then there's another note. In this case for Warwick, it's charms, fairies. A fairy has been tormenting Warwick for some time now. He's seen it watching from his window at night. So we have a little extra little something. So those are all cool things. We have George the Hunter. George is the only man who have seen the dragon and lived to tell the tale. And, he, and George knows where the dragon lives. Father William the Priest. You can get healing from him. Thinks that Ingrid, who we will see next, is a pagan witch. And concerning the dragon, William knows that Sir Brandon once slew a dragon. He sent Brother Dirk to the Knight's Barrow Mound to retrieve Brandon's magical sword, but he hasn't come back. Oh, no, no, Brother Dirk. Say it ain't so. Ingrid the Alchemist sells alchemical items. Also possesses, possesses something called a Firelight Citrine. Has a, oh, is a secret admirer of Warwick, but hasn't spoken to him too too shy to speak, but she sneaks over and leaves love letters as gifts. She hopes Warwick is doing okay. He's been acting rather worried. And she also knows that Vivian, the Witch of the Woods, might be able to help get rid of the dragon and the encroaching fairies. Ingrid knows her personally. So you have also an in. And then finally on this page, Farmer Gill. He will sell his mule, Seamus the Mule. Oh, no, you just sell Seamus? Poor Seamus. He knows the tale of Sir Brandon, so here's somebody who could tell the party the tale of Sir Brandon if they're, none of them are local and they don't know it themselves. And then of the dragon, Gil says that he valiantly drove it off when he caught it carrying off one of his cows. His boys are out trying to catch the thing now, so you need not worry about it. Yeah, probably not going to work out. I, I appreciate that there are they've built in some relationships between all these people. And like I said before, I like the bullet points that tell you different things. 
what they, you know, what they want, what they need, a little bit of how they are, but in a very compacted fashion. It's not a ton, but it's enough to get a feel for who these characters are and how they interrelate. So some more stuff about Brandonsford, about the we get a section on the missing missing booze. First, the situation, which is Quinn of the Golden Egg Tavern believes that Bentley's business rival has been stealing inventory from a seller to ruin him. And he's offered 100 gold pieces to find out what's happening. The truth is that Bentley has nothing to do with it. It's actually a Chloricon by the name of Naganin. And then we have some bits about Naganin comes at midnight, invisible. And then once they start drinking, once Naganin starts drinking, doesn't do much to hide his presence. And then what happens if you capture Naganin? And then we have a little bit of stats. I've never really heard of a Clericon before, but it sounds cool. I'm guessing some relation to a Leprechaun. Just a thought. Next, we have a little section on the Fairy Visitor. That is haunting Warwick the Smith. He has seen the creature, which he describes as a hooded phantom, staring at him through his bedroom window in the night. Some mornings he awakes to find flowers laid on his windowsill or strange talismans stuck to his door. The truth is that Warwick's fairy visitor is actually the town's alchemist, Ingrid. Ingrid has romantic feelings, but has trouble expressing them, so every night she's been going over and sort of staring and leaving stuff. Wow, and there's even a little bit here, hey, the, the party could try to blackmail Ingrid if they figure out what's going on, or the party could try to work with Ingrid to make her dream come true, to make her love connection. If they do, Ingrid will give the party her firelight citrine, along with a warning of the stone's explosive properties. Okay, so there we go. So that's Brandonsford. That will be your town location, presumably. <laughs> no, nothing said. Hey, no, nothing. Not cool behavior, Ingrid. Yeah, a little bit stalky, right? A little bit, a little bit not cool. But you know, she's in love. She's an alchemist in love. I suppose, given that she can make alchemical potions, she could probably do much worse to the man. But yeah, not cool. Okay, so in the woods. Now that we are entering the woods proper, we get a D twelve. Table of random encounters. Two and six each mile. Two and six chance each mile. And this is where, again, it would have been nice to have some sort of overlay on that map just to make gauging those miles a little bit, a little bit easier. But it's a small matter. Uh, just I'm just going to uh, just breeze through these. You can get some wolves, some drunk goblins. I like this one. Two idiot dragon hunters. These are Gil's sons, Tad and Zach. Tad is short and fat with four teeth. Zach is tall, dopey with a big Adam's apple. So they're essentially your kind of Laurel and Hardy, you know, short, fat guy, tall, skinny guy combo. They're planning to bait the dragon with a dead pig and then throw a net over it. Yeah, probably not going to work very well. They do have a pitchfork. I guess maybe a pitchfork each that does 1d4 damage. We have a dryad, uh, 1d10 sturges, 2d6 sprites, some signs of the dragon, a golden fox. It's got a pelt that's worth 1,000 gold pieces or more if undamaged. Two fey hounds, or wolf-like. A handful of pompous elvish hunters. They they are following they are following the Fey Hounds at a sauntering pace and will actively ignore the party unless they get in the way or they've killed the golden fox. I see. So they are oh, I didn't read the Fey Hounds and the Elvish Hunters are basically trying to hunt, find that golden fox. That's cool. I like that those are kind of linked together. We get some goblins, scavengers, and then if you roll a 12, you get the dragon. The creatures of the forest flee in its wake. The dragon is hunting for a meal, and then we'll get some stats on the next page. I'm down for these. I like the fact that the the dragon hunters, there was if you talk to Gil, you would know his sons are out there and you can run into them. Here we get the dragon itself. 
The beast moves like a fat alligator, dragging its bloated belly along the ground with each lumbering step, but with the potential to strike in an instant. Strings of spittle hang from its teeth, thick with foul poison. It lives only to eat and to protect its gold. When the dragon dies, its black scales melt away into steaming ooze, leaving behind the skeleton of a dwarf. Very cool. I like it. It's a non-flying dragon. Some nice visuals there with the dragging its bloated belly along on the ground, kind of lumbering, but with that quick strike potentiality. Spittle thick with foul poison. Good stuff. Ennui Incarnate, hello Ennui, says, man, I regret not being able to listen live. I love, love, love this module. At least I have something wonderful for later. Back to work. Have fun, guys. Hi, right. thanks for checking in. Glad to see you like the module. And yeah, please uh, check it out when you have a chance. But good to know. I've I'd heard good things about it. So nice to know that I have not been led astray. And of course, so far, so good. So I do not feel led astray as of yet. Now, nothing said, it's great that everyone is doing something, trying to kill a dragon, stalking a crush, worrying about a business rival, etc. The NPCs aren't justified by how they affect the PCs. Yes, I like that a lot, right? It makes the town feel like a living, breathing place, and the modules made it easy to pick out with your eye these different aspects of their characters. I, I definitely like kind of, hey, what they sell, what they want, what's bothering them. Right, so you get these little side quests that the party can mess around with or not, but yeah, it's a nice, a very nice, a very nice touch, and it, it definitely gives a, a more dynamic, vibrant sense to the town. Do I need to read the stats of the dragon? Anybody interested in that? It's got scales of glistening black, jaws dripping with poison, throat full of brimstone, so it does have a breath. And it's a spray of yellow sulfurous gas. Oh, that's kind of interesting in terms of damage. The breath weapon just does however much HP the dragon has as damage. It's a pretty neat way of doing it. So the weaker the dragon gets, the less powerful its breath gets. I'm not sure how much I like that. But it is kind of cool. So the dragon, you foresee at 32 hit points doing 32 points of damage on that dragon's breath. That's pretty rough. At low level, you it bursts out of those woods or wherever you happen to see it, and it breathes on you. You don't make that save. You're you're dead. You're all dead. Dead, 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 dead. If you can hack it down, though. At some point, it won't be able to kill you with its dragon breath, presuming you have hasn't been injured otherwise, right? If it's down to just a handful of hit points, then it's dragon's breath this weekend, which is kind of cool on the one hand. On the other hand, I really like that dragon's breath being this sort of Nova threat that's ever present. So it's a plus minus, but it's definitely an interesting way uh, of doing it. We have a stream. So this is, I think, the stream, the major water element that, as I mentioned before, flowing from the northeast to the southwest. And there are encounters in the for the stream. I like that they are differentiating a little bit for these different uh, ge geographical elements. This one is a D4 table. We can have Nixie traders, leprechaun fishermen, a river troll, a goblins, plus a giant beaver. <laughs> the goblins are attempting to annex the beaver's lodge. They're losing, and now the beaver's very angry. Oh, I kind of like that. So yeah, it's not it's not working with them. They are. Uh, I I sort of like the fact that these goblins seem to be pretty ineffectual at what they're doing. It could add some nice levity. It definitely adds a. Uh, it definitely gives it that kind of fairy tale sort of uh, feeling to it. These are not angry, mean goblins. I mean, they may try to be, but when you run upon them losing a fight with a giant beaver for that they're for some reason trying to annex its lodge, that's pretty humorous. Now we get the Witch of the Woods. The forest clearing gives way to a garden of topiary animals centered around a wattle hut. The topiaries are all of woodland creatures and humans, all eerily detailed. There's a pond with 10 Nixies that live in it. 
and they demand the PCs cast their weapons into the water or else the witch will turn them into shrubbery for her garden. Oh, so maybe there's a reason they're all eerily detailed. At the bottom of the pond, I'm guessing, the Nixies collected tributes, a pile of rusted weapons, 2d20 gold, a silver, silver bangle set with turquoise stones, 200 gold pieces, a gilded scabbard set with carnelians, arranged like blossoming flowers, 400 gold. I kind of like the idea that, that there's no usable weapon down there, but you get a beautiful scabbard. I also like that silver mangle. Inside the hut is a homely kitchen with a, with plush, overly quilted furniture one might expect to find in a grandmother's house. So we're seeming again to have that kind of fairy tale vibe, right? Like go to grandmother's house in the woods. And then we finally will see Vivian the witch. Gray frizzy hair, hunched, one bulging eye, wrinkled old purple dress. So this is right out of that, that Bugs Bunny cartoon where the, he ends up with the witch. Isn't she wearing purple? Is her name Vivian? Not exactly an evil witch, but just too old to care about being polite. And she can get carried away discussing her topiary hobby. Of the dwarves, she was quite fond of the eldest brother, Grimney. Last time he visited, he told her of a vast amount of gold they stumbled on in the mines. So she can give us some information. And I like the fact that they have these kind of question marks next to the bullets, right? If the players ask about dwarves, we can look at this and easily see, oh, dwarves, this is what she knows, right? And then of the dragon, also set up in the same way as the dwarves prompt, Vivian knows one way to help kill the beast. There are magical trees in the western woods that drip wine like sap. The wine is magically potent enough to knock a mortal unconscious with the slightest sip. But be warned, the place is frequented by fawns who would not take kindly to someone stealing their drink. And then of the pond, if you ask nicely, Vivian will call off the Nixies and let you take whatever you want from the pool. She doesn't care. So if you play nicely with all this, you, you can get at the pool without having to try to, you know, terminate everyone. There's no stats given for Vivian that I see here. Your first level players or characters, you know, she's a witch. I wouldn't advise it, but one could never know. Next, we have a Fawn's Grove. A heavy, sickly sweet aroma has settled in this part of the forest where the trees bleed red wine in place of sap. Sounds of mirth and music echo from an unknown source. So this is where the witch is pointed you to if you manage to talk to the witch. I guess, so I'm trying to just to kind of think how the wine is going to work here or, or, or what, what the suggestion of the wine is, right? So the Vivian tells you, hey, the wine can knock a mortal unconscious. I'm guessing the, the dragon counts as a mortal. I usually think of dragons as kind of immortals or nigh immortals, much like elves. But in this case, being that it's a, a I guess, a dragon transformed from greed, maybe it's still considered a, considered a mortal. I suppose the idea is that you can knock the, the dragon out with the wine. Here in the Fawn's Grove, are those trees. They must be tapped or cut to ret retrieve a sizable amount of the wine. Damaging one will cause the ambient music to screech to a halt as 1d4 fawns appear to confront the party. So you got to tap or just brute force cut, cut the trees to get enough or to get some portion of the wine. The wine is magical. After drinking, you have to make a save versus poison. If you fail, you fall unconscious. Or you fall unconscious on a failure or become incredibly drunk, minus three to all rolls, on a success. Each of these effects lasts 1d10 hours. So even if you succeed, you're going to be ridiculously drunk. And if you fail, you just drop unconscious for 1 to 10 hours. The fawns are willing to trade their wine for sentimental items. And examples include Ingrid's love letters, a dwarf's pick, a pixie treasure. They mean a pixie treasure or a nixie treasure? I suppose there are pixies around, so maybe it is a pixie treasure. They will not accept coin. Each fawn has a golden wine goblet worth 300 gold pieces. Something else I like here, right? We have these fawns. There's something that we don't have to have, but it could be useful because we could trick, somehow trick the dragon or figure out how to get the wine into the dragon's mouth. 
That would certainly help if it's going to fall unconscious for one to 10 hours. Great. And even if the worst case scenario, if we do get the wine into the dragon and it makes it save, it's still going to be minus three on all, all rolls because it'll be incredibly drunk. So that's really good. We could fight the fawns for it, but they are willing to trade and they're asking for stuff that depending on what we, how much of the community of Brandonsford we've explored, we might be able to pick up on things that might match up, right? Sentimental items, things that are infused with some emotion. Maybe we can think of stuff we've seen around. Maybe the, the party would, I mean, they're, it's a new party, so probably they won't have amassed their own sentimental items, but potentially they could trade away their own. Or there's certainly been introduced in the various elements here things they could find, which I, I dig it. The giant's house is described as a cottage three times the size of a normal house built from cyclopean rocks. It is fitted with a tree bark door, a mud brick chimney, and a window. A horrible roaring sound drones on from inside. It's got a chimney that belches out a column of thick smoke. It's got a window from which warm, flickering firelight pours out. Through the window, you can see a wooden dining table, a pot cooking in the fireplace, and a sack sat against the wall. This is setting up for more, at least the fairy tale vibe I'm getting of what might be in that sack. The horrible sound is a thunderous growling, heavy breathing that repeats inside the house. So I guess here with the giant's house, just to stop here, again, something I like, clear bullet points, each one representing one element of the house. So if you're getting this as a GM, get to the giant's house, you give it that overall description. Maybe the party's trying to think about things to do. And someone says, Hey, can I look in the window and right there? You don't have to hunt and hunt and find it in a, a big narrative block of text. I can just go right to that bullet point window is bolded right. There is a little bit about what you get through the window. Asking about the horrible sound. What's that noise? You get a little bit more information on the noise. Oh, do we want to try to sneak into the chimney? Well, here's a little bit more about that chimney. It's got a thick column of smoke coming out of it. So I like that. Now, looking to inside the house, or if they, I suppose if they get inside the house, we have the major elements bullet pointed again. First, the fireplace, roaring fire, heating a giant cauldron, scorched bottom, rumbling hid, lid. The cauldron holds boiling water and chopped vegetables. If the whole thing is tipped over, it deals 1d8 damage plus a save or spend one round screaming in pain. Hey, Don. Nice of you to join the chat. Just watching from the beginning. Hope all is well. All is good, my friend. All is grand. So we have the fireplace. Then we have the giant. 16 feet tall, sleeping in a giant cushy chair, head slumped to one side, booming snore, wears hide clothes, yellow brown, homemade, and a gold necklace, giant sized, worth 400 gold pieces. If the giant wakes up, he'll chase after the party with intent to kill, shouting about how he, quote, told you stinking little goblins to stay off my land, unquote. The wriggling sack contains a bound and gagged monk, Brother Dirk. Dirk was captured by the giant on his way to Sir Brandon's Barrow Mound. If released, he will loudly thank the party, which presumably means he will wake up the giant. All right. So again, right, we've got the inside the house and then all the major features nicely bullet pointed. I can get the information I need right away. Brother Dirk is there. So we've got that little subplot. We could just kind of put a bow in that, right? Come full circle why the giant is maybe annoyed or I suppose it doesn't really matter since either he's angry at you or he just wants to eat you either thing, probably not good for you, but it certainly feeds back into the, the themes that are going on. One of which is the goblins making a, a nuisance of themselves. And we get some stats for the giant and for brother Dirk, who is a level two lawful cleric. Next up, on our location playlist, we have a destroyed caravan. Ruined tents and corpses lie around a burnt wagon tipped onto its side that breathes wisps of stinking smoke. 
more bullet points here. The first one's interesting. It, it's marked as first visit. 1d6 plus 1 goblin scavengers. So I guess the first time you come, goblin scavengers will be there picking through the wreckage. What I guess is interesting about that is I don't often see things marked out as first visit. So I like that because often I'll think about, well, what if they come back, right? So this one makes clear that they're not always going to be goblin scavengers there, but the first time you visit, they're going to, they're going to be there. I might even say, uh, put a percentage chance because presumably they would keep scavenging, scavenging there. And if any escape, they might want to come back, maybe hoping that the party's gone or thinking that if other people are chasing them off, there must be something really valuable there. And these goblins seem just goofy enough to do that. Of the elements here, we have the wagon singed by corrosion with a smell of sulfur. Most of the trade goods they carried are gone. This gives us some hints about the dragon. We had already seen earlier what the dragon's breath is like, but here the party can get a sense of it. They, uh, they, they inspect it. They will, they will notice the corrosion. They will notice the smell of sulfur. There are bodies, unfortunately. Tradesmen and their guards, battered and pierced armor. Some are missing fingers, hands, and heads. Not so nice. And then tents that are ripped by claws, speckled with blood. So all the hallmarks of a dragon attack. We then get to the dwarves mine. The remains of a log cabin lie in a rotting heap at the base of a hill. In the hill itself, there's an, the old post and lintel entrance to a mine shaft sealed shut by a cave in. Of the log cabin, it's blackened, crumbling timber, timbers, clearly burnt down, jutting out of a pile of broken furniture and roofing. If you search the ref wreckage, you have a chance to find some stuff. Could be some iron ingots, could be a mining pick engraved with a name. You roll randomly to see whose mining pick it was. You might find 2d20 gold pieces. You might find some gems. You might find a dwarven corpse. And you might find a bejeweled silver beard comb. So a few things. I like that they're both valuable. And I like to hear the mining pick. It hints back to that. Uh, the looking for sentimental items. Here you could find one of the, um, a mining pick from one of the one of the dwarves that would surely be looked upon as being sentimental. In fact, it's put as one of the things, examples of sentimental items. But I presume that the bejeweled silver beard comb probably also be sentimental. I would imagine. Of the cave-in, tunnels filled with a mound of dirt and wooden fragments. If the players spend three turns digging through the debris, they will find a dead body underneath. The dead body is a dwarf killed by the cave-in. On its ming middle finger, it wears the soul-catching ring. Ooh, soul-catching ring. If you put the ring on, the ghost of Grimney, one of the Dwarven brothers, appears as a hallucination only the wearer can perceive. And then we get a little bit about Grimney, who insists the wearer, or the wearer take his ring to his brothers so that he can tell them how he was killed. When he finds out his brothers are dead, he will be willing to help the PCs. And he knows where Brawl might have taken the treasure. I guess that's the brother who turned into the dragon. An old cave the brothers found out east, a.k.a. the dragon's lair. Recall, if they search enough, they could find the dragon's lair themselves. However, here we have a way they could shortcut that process if they are a bit diligent in going through the wreckage and they are curious about the ring will help cut down on their hunting for the dragon's lair, but it doesn't prevent them from finding it. This is not a blockage. This is not an obstacle where if the party doesn't do these things, they're just going to throw up their hands and go, well, I guess we got to leave because we can't find it right there. They have other paths forward, but you're getting these things sprinkled out through the, the module that can help give you a clue that might speed up your search, but nothing's preventing you which i like i appreciate that if you just need to if everything else is failing you could certainly brute force find the dragon's lair and just try to kill it with normal weapons but if you can be a bit clever if you can find you can find some clues that can lead you to some solutions that can help you though i'm still really curious about how you're gonna get the dragon to drink the wine but you know that's hey players figure it out i'm sure i'm sure there are ways to do it and potentially finally 
we get to the dragon's lair itself, a lonely cave at the base of the mountains flanked by bleached or sorry, blackened trees. The darkness within is pierced by the sparkling gold and jewels piled inside. We get another first visit sort of, uh, I guess, marker or bullet point. So the first time you visit, the dragon is here sleeping on its hoard. Future visits, there's only a three and six chance of it to be here. If not, it has a three and six chance to return each turn. So presumably every 10 minutes, there's basically a 50% chance for the dragon to show up. There is a bolded asterisk note here that says, if you take the dragon's treasure, it will find you, which I like. I almost think, why not just let the dragon be three and six chance every visit? Why on the first visit if, it, if it's here? I, I might just let let chance decide, because I think the idea of having some fun if the party decides to be greedy before they finish the job, in other words, let's just take the treasure and forget this dragon, is interesting. So I'd like to give them that option, even if it's the first time they found the lair. The dragon, when it is here, streamers of yellow smoke arise from the cave mouth and the stones shake with its deep rumbling breaths. Yeah, I might want to put that up more on the list. Well, I suppose, I don't know, it's hard to say. Because, yeah, you are kind of figuring out if the dragon's here first. So, yeah, I, I guess there's no neat way to make that. But the only reason why I mentioned it all is because it kind of plays into the description that you might give. Because first you're talking about it's just kind of dark and the trees are blackened and you see the sparkling of jewels, but then you have to kind of amend that if the streamers are yellow smoke are rising. So you might want to just pre pre do the uh, pre roll the dragon stuff first before you start opening your mouth. I suppose that's always a good thing to do is read the full. If you don't get too caught up in the action, read all the information first or at least scan it. And this formatting makes it pretty easy to scan to get what you need so that you can make sure your, your info you're giving your players is on point and you don't have to make lots of edits or just forget. Treasure, the dragon's hoard built upon the once buried treasure of Carmelo the Cursed. The treasure is piled under the upturned chest it was originally buried in. The hoard contains a nest of 9,000 gold pieces, six golden rings on severed fingers. Ugh. Garnet earrings still attached to decaying human head. Whew. Man, Carmelo. A skull with ruby eyes and a rainbow of gemstone teeth. Interesting. One diamond and Carmelo's jeweled cutlass, which is on page 17. So there's a little more interest here, right? So maybe it wasn't just the dragon sickness, but something to do with this cursed horde of Carmelo, who himself was cursed. Oh, I guess that wasn't the last location because we still have the Goblin Castle. A, a skeleton of crumbling rocks and ivy, the ruins of a temple dedicated to a forgotten wild god, evidenced by images of flowering vines on columns and weathered leafy faces on the stonework. The Goblin King Hogboon has taken over the place to use as his quote-unquote castle. And we have some simple areas laid out. Did we see? I don't think we got a particular map for that, did we? Did I just... I'm just going to skip back just to see, did I miss a map for this? Or are they just giving us some areas? Nope. So no map of the Goblin Castle yet. I'm going to click forward. Did they give us one at all? Oh, we do. So there is a map in the back that's got the Goblin Castle. Cool. We have a common area. It's got some goblin houses and about 10 goblins in it. The second area is an effigy that has some workers and the effigy. It looks like it's made by the goblins from stuff they've scrounged out. They have have a garbage area, an armory, a clover patch, and the, the throne. On which sits Hogboon the Goblin King. Oh, it looks like you can get a task from Hogboon. Oh, I see. There's one note I missed at the top. The goblins will not try to kill the party when encountered. Instead, they will try to capture them and bring them before the king for sentencing. So some more role-playing. And I always... I think that's a good thing. I think too often... I know we, we want to show that, oh, the OSR, it's lethal, it's lethal, it'll kill you. But something that's overlooked is that the party, they're kind of wild cards. They're resources. 
That's why I always like spells like Quest or, or Gaius, because that recognizes that a party of adventurers is a great tool to be used if you can force them into service. How Hogwin would do this without a spell like Gaius or Quest, I don't know, but it, it's something that's one of those fictional things we see in movies that seems goofy all the time, you know, where you, the villain will find the hero and they could clearly just kill them now and end it, but instead they want to make the hero work for them. But that's because the hero is somebody exceptional and it would be a waste a horrible waste of resources just to get rid of this exceptional tool when you could try to turn it and use it yourself. And I think that not often enough do antagonists do that with the party. It can be difficult and the party's liable to try to double cross you, but that's also extremely common in the kinds of cultural and, and fiction, you know, sources that we have. It happens all the time. But it, whoops. Sorry about that. I bought my mic, but it's certainly something worth exploring. I think, anyway. All right, so Hogmoon wants the PCs to find the dragon who lives in the forest, capture it, and bring it back to him alive. He keeps his re reasons secret, but offers the party the opportunity to become knights of the Goblin Kingdom if they do the job. Drug it. Lock it in a cage. I don't care what you do. Just bring it to me. Hogmoon will give the party a rope of unburdening to help transport the dragon once they've incapacitated it. And remember, if they found the wine, they do have a way to do that if they choose to. If the party brings back the dragon, Hogboon grants them knighthood and gifts them with a goblin squire to use as a personal pack mule and or guinea pig. I suppose that could be nice. So you got to bring back the dragon and everybody gets a goblin. Woohoo! Free goblin! Uh, all right, so we have some stats for the goblins. We have stats for the goblin king, Hogboon. He has an emerald ring that can change a non-living, non-magical object into a plant or transformed a changed object back. So it's got this kind of uh, thing to plant or plant to thing. Thing to plant? Yeah. Thing to plant and back again. All right. And what will he do with the dragon? He plans to use the dragon to complete his takeover of the woods by charming it to obey him. Using the dragon, Hogboon will move to destroy Brandonsford and drive the other fairies out of the woods. Oh, so I see. So he Ho Hogboon does have Charm Person as a spell, so potentially he could ensorcel one or more players, I guess one, players with one of those spells. He does also have Sleep, which would come in handy, and he could, has Invisibility. So he's got some tools. And we also have a barrel mound. Oh, I wonder where we're going to find the barrel mound. The door is a white stone slab set into a mound. A bleached, faded mirror on its surface shows a conquering knight. All right, this must be where that, uh, that knight who potentially has a magic sword is found. So we have the entrance. We have an antechamber. We have the knight's crypt. There are some goblins here who are poking around. We find the burial alcoves. Which one of which one of we'll see one of one there's a chain mail in one. Let's see, there's a gray ooze that's sealed beneath a heavy flagstone. Oh, and the, I see the goblins have trapped a gray ooze inside there, and so they try to keep the party away from undoing it if they do. I guess the goblins aren't just hostile. Oh, I see. It says in their description. Isn't it nice when you read the descriptions? Uh, the goblins are willing to join the PCs and they promise to help clear out the lower level, but will flee at the first sign of trouble. So they're help, but not much help. We get some relics. We get some statues. I'm guessing... Yeah, so if there's... So, sorry. So, after the... In, in the other last two alcoves, after the chainmail shirt, which also has a mace, then the flagstone with the great ooze, there's finally a jewel-encrusted dagger... Not magical, but worth some money. And then the last one has a secret door that leads to relics, which it has a in it, which area that has a chest with relics in it that could be sold for a bunch of money if you can get it out of there. And some candles, only slightly used, but the holders are worth a little coin. There are some statues of several knightly virtues: valor, piety, wisdom, and duty. You can hear some dripping water that's coming from the chapel. 
In the chapel, you have some disintegrating stone pews, a moldy statue. Ah, uh, it's kind of like a yellow mold, because if you touch the mold, you touch the statue, it releases a spore cloud, which I remember is a is a yellow mold thing, I think. And then if you do clean it off, you can receive a you you receive a blessing, which is plus one to all rolls made while in these woods. So that's pretty strong. And there's dripping water from a crack in the ceiling that's falling on the statue. Now we get to the lower level. We have wandering monsters every, uh, let's see, each turn, two and six chance. And the wandering monsters are basically one of the undead knights that haunt the barrow. I guess one is named Sir Alfred. And the other one is a floating skull of Sir Wilt or Wilt. Sir Wilt? Wilt? We'll get a corridor with cold, wet air. Some bodies of some goblins that tried to run away. It didn't make it. There's mist seeping in through cracks. Got some wall carvings and a scratching and chittering sounds that are coming from the next area. And I like this a lot that in the in the area before the area where the, the thing that where the, the kind of sense is, you get it. So you get some sounds. And so when you're talking about area seven, you can you can mention the sounds without having to go duck down to to the next area to see where they're coming from. You can just talk about it in part of it. And I like that it's called out sounds. Boom. I can just I can find it. You know, right away. The next area is marked as food. Six clay and four A are overturned on the floor. Fat black creatures skitter around the refuse. The M4A are spilling out cheese, hardened bread, dried beef, and dried fruits. All very, very spoiled. The creatures are a bunch of giant rats. And we do get some stats for the giant rat in case you need it. The next area is called perfume scent of lavender and there are amphorae full of flower scented oils finally we get to a shrine a statue on a dais statues of a clay figure of a nude antlered man he holds a wand in his left hand and a spear in his right there are stones uh, which are a ring of ten warding stones if anything passes over them they begin to shake for one turn creating a loud enough clatter to attract one of the knights Moving a stone out of place stops the effect. That's kind of cool. Offering bowls. One is filled with silver, one with gold. Oh, no, sorry. One is filled with silver and gold. The other is filled with some rubies. Near the bowls is a golden amulet, which has a slip of a protection from evil spell scroll. And then if you search the room, if you examine the south wall, you'll notice an incongruous groove in the stone, which is a secret door to a further in area. We also have a slime pool. It's five foot deep. And if you enter it, you get attacked by the slime, which, you know, what did you expect? It is a slime pool. Oh my gosh. On contact, it digests armor in six rounds, flesh in 1d4 rounds, unless killed by fire or a cure disease spell. While in water, its weakness to fire is negated. Characters will have to remove it from the pool or kill it in some some other way to enter the pool unscathed. Oh, that's that's interesting. So that's a a um, that is a nice wrinkle, right? So the slime is in the pool. If you try to fight the slime in the pool, it's basically protected from its one of its biggest weaknesses. So how do you get it out of the pool? That's you know for you to figure out, but. Even if you think you know how to deal with a slime, how do you deal with it when it's submerged in water? Take that. If you're able to do all this, at the bottom of the pool, there's a silver dagger and a human skeleton with gold teeth. No magic yet, though. Well, I guess it makes sense. If you're coming in here to get the magic sword, it would be a little bit of a downer if you got something just as good, basically, in the pool. Though the pool is is, is going to be tricky. I'm not sure how you'd get the uh, that slime out of the pool. We have an armory. It has spider webs, and if you look closely, you'll, you could see the giant spider lurking under just kind of the detritus of broken shields and weapons. If you touch the webs, it jumps out to attack. The shields and weapons themselves are decorative, rusted, and beaten. 
If you take time to scrape away the rust, you will find some jewels, some six tiny amethysts, and an emerald that are socketed into various decorations. But you have to rip through the spider webs to do that. So you can leave it alone or fight the giant spider. And if you're really good and thorough with the rusted stuff, you'll be rewarded. Again, something else I like here. We've you've often you run into uh, you know, we think about when we're building dungeons, so there's rooms full of junk. Well, yes, here's is a room full of junk with a hazard. Maybe as a party, you might even meta put it together. Like, okay, if there's a creature here, maybe this is not junk. But even then, to get to you know the good stuff, it's going to take a time, which you may not feel like you have, or just may mean that other things are showing up, to really scrape away the rust. And then you're not finding, oh, there's a magic sword plus eight that I've been looking for, but it's some jewels. So a good source of experience points, but you got to really work work for it and make that calculation. Do I feel like it's just junk? So this spider is kind of a trap, so we should leave it alone, or let's take care of the spider. Then we look through the stuff, but not, nothing obvious is going to be there because it's all rusted over and all grimed up, and there's nothing that's whoever has detect magic. If they cast, it's not going to see anything pop up. If you then think to take the next step, and that time, then you, you get rewarded. So it's a way of kind of putting some treasure in, in the junk while still maintaining that theme of, you know, that there are, not everything is going to be super valuable, right? There are going to be rooms full of junk, but if you're super careful with the junk, maybe you'll get something out of it. Maybe, maybe you won't, I, but I like that. Ooh, we get to a salon. It's got some wall paintings, some stone chairs, and an empty pitcher. We have some warrior statues. When the party enters the room, Sir Murden's ghost, unchanging scowl, black robes, moves like ink in water, will emerge from the shadows to attack, howling that the party has trespassed on sacred ground. And there's also nine statues, conical five-foot stones, carved to look like soldiers, each holds a real spear. We get some stats for Sir Murden's ghost. With one ability, which is Call to Arms in which Mirrodin uses his ghostly powers to command a statue to charge toward a character with its weapon drawn. Save or take 1d8 damage. If the save is successful, the statue crashes into a wall and shatters. Oh, so it's kind of one-timer. What happens if you fail the save? Does it uh, just go back? I suppose maybe it just goes back to its spot, right? It just charges forward and then kind of backs up. That's cool. That's nice. It's a little bit different because I think people are going to be, you're going to assume that, oh, the statue is going to come alive, but this is a nice way to kind of change it up a little bit. Plus, there's going to be that nice moment where the ghost comes out to attack. The party's all waiting for these statues to come alive because why wouldn't you assume they're going to come to life? They always do in these kind of situations. It doesn't. Maybe a round goes by, then suddenly Sir Murden says, you know, attack, and then one of these random statues just all of a sudden rushes into you if you make your save, it gets destroyed, so you, you might feel good there. But if you fail, and then it backs up and then stays still again. Now maybe you got one eye on that statue, and of course there are a bunch of other statues. So I like it. He's nice. He's fun. We have a cleric's workroom with a desk, a book, and a footlocker. The book is a holy book entitled Lives of Saints. Fairies cannot sound, stand the sound of someone reading from the book, which makes it really interesting, and it's worth 2,000 gold. There is a locked footlocker filled with fist-sized rocks with odd shapes chisel, chiseled into them. Ooh, I wonder if that's going to be meaningful or just a weird little thing. Oval Team Patrol, an hour late. Yeah, I'm running over. I'm going to try to get through the end of this before I call it quits. I, I feel like I can get through it without going to two parts. Glad you checked it at all. Yeah, check back later. It'll be on It'll be on the YouTube or wherever you like to watch my videos or listen to them in podcast form. I'm here for you. Finally, we get to the crypt of Sir Wilt. Healing murals, a sarcophagus, bottles, three potions of healing, a potion, four potions of sleep. Wow. One potion of tranquility. Sir Wilde's skeleton has some stats, so presumably it will come alive. And it bears the silver axe of Sir Wilde. 
When it lands an attack with its axe, roll for a random body part to be severed from the target. Holy moly. I think you might need to have a little chart of what that means because I don't have a great, I don't have a chart like that standing by. Not hard to make one up, but in this case, I might say, yeah, let me just put, I got room here. I could figure it out. Let me just put in a quick one at your head, two at your, or, you know, whatever bottom band and body parts are in play. Is it all of them? Could, could you literally get beheaded Vorpal style with this axe? Or are we saying it's just arms and legs? And man, for a first level party, how are you? I think that, that is that adventure is done, or is there somebody here that because maybe I was just not reading everything, missed who might be able to reattach severed limbs or magic up some new ones? There is the crypt of Sir Murden. A sarcophagus lies open with its lid broken on the floor, revealing the decrepit corpse held inside. The corpse is dried out mummy. Two platinum coins have been placed over his eyes. The hands are folded on his chest over the top of two six-inch rune stones, each inscribed with two random cleric spells. So, very nice. There's also the crypt of Sir Alfred. There's a smell of stinking wet rot. The sarcophagus is open and empty. Next, we have the maiden. A statue of a noble woman stands in the center of the room. She holds a sword horizontally in front of her with her proud eyes looking down before her. Flush with the wall behind her is a closed set of stone doors. So of the statue, it says, If a character stands before the maiden, they will hear a female voice in their head say, What makes a true knight? If they answer with the words from the statues in Area 5, Valor, Piety, Wisdom, and Duty, in any order, the door will open. So very clever. You get a nice little puzzle, but it's thematic, which I dig, right? It's even if it wasn't a puzzle, those statues, given that you're in a knight's tomb, make total sense. And the fact that those same things, which are thematic to a knight, would then show up here is not just, oh, there's this weird thing that's a puzzle. No, it makes sense. Even if the statues weren't there, this part makes sense. But the fact that now you have a, a way that you've tied them together in a way that allows the party to try to help or some clues to help figure out the puzzle, but it's also thematic. It's not just you're in a, you're in a warrior's tomb. Now do this Sudoku, right? It, it makes sense. So kudos, kudos to the author for that puzzle. Stone doors are locked. If you attempt to open the doors without being knighted by the maiden, she will animate an attack grinding across the floor, like a giant chess piece. That's a, Wonderful sensory image. Searching the room, anyone examining the north wall will notice a section of the stonework is brighter and slightly depressed, which is a secret door that leads to... It's the other end of the secret door we found in an earlier area. This door can be wrenched open with a crowbar or similar tool. Finally, the tomb of Sir Brandon. The room is dominated by a wooden dragon-headed ship Inside the ship is a stone sarcophagus with a statue on its lid of a knight who lies peacefully as if asleep, clutching a longsword. Treasures have been meticulously placed around the sarcophagus. All right, so this is the sarcophagus of Brandon. He's still dressed in plate armor and holds his holy sword. Holy diver, get your holy sword. Treasure, we've got five brass, brass urns full of dust, but the urns are worth some money, a kite shield, and a jeweled chalice. Which are, both of those are also worth some money. Here we get some maps. Is that is that it? So that's, I guess maybe that's it. Maps of the barrows. Oh, Appendix B. Okay, so we get the, the magic items. Carmelo's jeweled cutlass is a cutlass plus one, plus three versus lawful opponents. The Emerald Ring of the Goblin King. If you, let's see, the ring can, has been, has, can be, okay, there's a typo there. The ring can be used to transform any non-living, non-magical object into a plant or change it back again. If you kill the wearer of this ring and take it as your own, you become the new Goblin King. Goblins from Fairy will obey you unquestioningly. While you have the ring, you will also be hunted by the agents of power-hungry fa hungry fairies who want the rings for themselves. So that's really a fascinating 
magic. I mean, that is a campaign changing, campaign creating magic item. It'd be funny if you couldn't take it off. Or that transformation is, you know, it's it's finished. The power is interesting, too. I wonder if I would have the Goblin King having used that power in his throne room. So there's something really cool, but but maybe a statue of something. And he's able to turn it into a plant and, you know, command it to do something. It doesn't really say you can command the plants. So maybe it's just, oh, look, I can make this a plant or not. The Firelight Citrine. A glassy orange stone the size of an egg and warm to the touch produces light as a torch when shaken. If exposed to an open flame, it causes a violent explosion and it's worth some money. Right? So we have some nice things here. There's a couple of utility things. Hey, use it, use it as a torch. You could tie it to a, a, a stick and shake it and there you have a torch. But hey, could be useful against a dragon because it's basically a grenade if you expose it to an open flame. So there's another option of something you might end up with, might not. That might give you a tool to fight the dragon. We have the Rope of Unburdening. A 20-foot long enchanted rope, which when hitched to an object, makes that object feel as light as a feather to the person pulling the load. To everyone else, the object retains its normal weight. The rope loses its magic if cut. So that's pretty neat. Helpful for dragging dragons. The Lives of the Saints which is that holy book. Fae beings hate the sound of someone reading from the book and fairies close to the reader will be doubled over in pain as if the sound of it is deafening. So definitely a great tool, anti-goblin tool, if you can figure out how to use it, but worth money if you don't, assuming you find it. The Holy Sword of Sir Brandon, a long sword made from a silvery white metal. A sentence is etched into the blade. All shadows yield to my light. Maybe I should read that more. Let me get All shadows yield to my light. Got to try to get some more dramatic flair in there. The wielder of the sword is immune to all forms of deception, magical or otherwise. The sword has plus one to attacks and damage, increased to plus three against evil beings. Would be also handy for the dragon. The silver axe of Sir Wilde. A bearded axe made entirely of polished silver. Leafy vines are embossed along the shaft. The axe cannot harm inert material like stone, wood, or metal, but cleaves through flesh and bone like butter, able to effortlessly slice off limbs upon making contact. Man, that's that's a nasty magic item and way more valuable, I would imagine, against the dragon than anything else we found since you can essentially end the fight with one potential swing. I'm, I don't know if I wouldn't mind some kind of curse or some other uh, something else attached to it to make it to not make it so overpowering. I mean, you're playing this as a one shot. It's kind of fun. Well, who, who cares? So you have the silver axe of Sir Wild. But man, if that character isn't going to go on to other adventures, I'd want it to have some kind of emerald ring type effect where like other people are going to be hunting you for that axe because it is crazy. Or there's a chance you might slice off your own limb or you are. You feel this irresistible pull to guard the uh, barrel mound of Sir Brandon. You know, something to make it not just uh, giving a Vorpal Sword to a... I mean, this is even better than a Vorpal Sword. I think a Vorpal Sword, you had to crit. Uh, Maybe mixing up my additions, whatever Vorpal Swords. But I don't even think a Vorpal Sword was quite just you make contact, you're slicing off something. Though maybe the Vorpal Sword was instant kill. I don't recall, but that's... That's wicked. And then we get the Warden Warding Stones. Each with a flat face inscribed with a single rune. The stones become active when arranged into a circle, regardless of dimensions. When active, if any living thing passes through the circle, the stones begin to rumble and glow for one turn. That's cool. Hey, Chip. Says, I just added a Lives of the Saints book in my Dolmenwood dungeon. Now I don't have to figure out what it does. What book is this again? This is the Black worm of brandon's Ferd. if you check the show notes chip you will see where you can find it i put a link directly to it in drive through so you can catch it there but it is the black worm of brandon's Ferd. then we get the uh, license and then we're done 
All right. So it took me a little bit over an hour, but not too, not too bad. Happy to get through it. I really dig this a lot. Obviously, I have not played this. Or maybe, or I, it might not be obvious, but I haven't played it. But reading it, I don't think there's anything that I really think needs a ton of work. There are probably a couple of spots, a couple of typos, things like that. That obviously is no big deal. It was super easy to fix. I really like the bulleted approach. I really, I really think as someone who will just get a wild hair and just grab something and, and throw it in the game, if I'm going to do that at all, something like this is nice because if I haven't prepped it, I haven't gone through and read it all. The bullet points make it really easy to find these bits that I might need. Uh, 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 one of the players says, oh, what do, what do I hear? Oh, look, there's a bullet point that says sounds that tells me the sounds. Like, just great. Oh, there's we're looking at a, a, a cabin. What if I look in the window? Oh, there's a thing that says window that tells me exactly kind of what you see looking through the window. Really great. Uh, as we... as uh, talked about earlier uh, the town of brandonsford is kind of nicely fleshed out doesn't have a ton of stuff i don't need a ton of stuff but it, i like the, the idea that it gives me a cast of characters who are all interconnected in some way they don't look like they're just waiting there to give you you know as quest givers to give you work they actually have different things going on i, I think it encourages the party to really explore these different people presumably at least the first time they get the sense that one of these characters is more fleshed out. I think it would definitely encourage them to figure out things about the other characters. And the fact that the char these different people are interconnected means that naturally investigating one or examining them or being curious about one of them will lead threads, will be trailed out to other things, and also in into the greater wilds. The areas are all uh, good. I don't, I don't see anything that was missing. I think they all have that really nice sort of dark tinged fairy tale vibe to it. I love the kind of inept goblins. I also like the fairy aspect of the treasure that turned the dwarf into the dragon and the fact that you have the ring that turned somebody into the goblin king. All fun stuff. I think in it would be a great intro to that sort of campaign if you wanted to run a really fairy tale whimsical kind of campaign. This is a great intro to that. If you're not running a fairy tale inspired campaign and you want to use this, you might need to <clears throat> edit a few of those things, turn up or down the whimsy to suit, but I like it a lot. You get some good adventure hooks if you need them. I like that the connections, or sorry, the different locations, like the characters, all kind of interconnect. Nothing stopping you from just heading, beelining straight to the dragon and trying to kill it that way. But being curious, investigating a lot of these different areas, hints of which you will get through those characters in town and other things, can give you tools to make it easier. But there's nothing gating you from stopping. Oh, you didn't go to the, the mound and you don't have the magic sword? Well, it might be harder for you to deal with the dragon, but it's not impossible. You could still figure out other ways. Oh, you didn't get the wine? Okay, well, it would have been useful, but you didn't need it. Maybe you got something else. And, of course, you could just be super just brute force about it and just say, yeah, we're just going <laughs> to go up and down the map until we encounter every little thing, which you could do that, too. It's not very efficient, and you might not get what you want, but that's also there for you. So I like that. I like that there are ways that 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 feed into the kind of the osr things that they talked about the front right oh uh, being curious being inquisitive being clever all the, if you use those things in this module you'll be rewarded with tools to make the adventure easier but if you don't it's going to be hard for you but you can still do it which to me is that kind of osr play that i like if you you can't figure it out you got to be crude you can be crude there are just consequences to that or you can be clever and make things a lot easier for yourself which is great so yeah, I like this one a lot. Let me know if you have run it or, or if you've run it <clears throat> or you've played in it. Drop me a line in the comments or wherever you find me. Let me know what you think. I Like I said, I'd heard good things about it, so it led me to check it out. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm kind of a, I'm always a fan of low-level adventures. I don't know why. I, I feel like there's, I know this is not a new concept, right? That the idea that low-level D&D has kind of a special People either, I think, love it or hate it. I think the people who love it would kind of almost wish that you could just play 
entirely in low levels where things are deadly and players and characters both are not you know the, the sort of magical mysterious stuff hasn't become mundane to them yet so everything is still that wonder is still there so i'm always intrigued i always think whenever i think about writing modules i always think about writing low level adventures it just I, know, I find it a lot more interesting than high level adventures i think maybe it's that lack of having a lot of tools you don't have the magic armor yet you don't have tons of magic items yet you don't have magic weapons yet you don't have tons of spells so you got to lean on other kind of things that that being able to just brute force it to say ah we're just going to just attack and kill everything is a more viable option the higher level you get at low levels you really have to think hard about should we talk to these people or creatures and that leads to a lot more interesting interactions to where you get stronger to where you're either acting cocky all the time and just ordering things around or you're just like ah we gotta kill right we can kill so we'll just kill so i really dig it but this is a good one i i would totally run this for a group i could really see running it Maybe it would shine, I might say, with younger audience because of the fairy tale nature of it. I think my daughter, she's seven, and I haven't really started getting her into gaming yet, but the idea, the concept of the treasure that turns someone into a dragon or the ring that turns you into the goblin king, these all speak to things, right? She's seen Labyrinth. She, she, she likes that movie, and that has that same, you know, I can almost sort of play into that same sort of setting for this. So I think it really works there. Not that it's, I mean, I would love to run it and play it with adults, but I think that this is really a fun, just the way with the fairy tale elements, it really, I think would be a really great adventure to bring in new, younger, younger players into an OSR game. If you so chose anyhow, those are my thoughts. That's all I got. Really great chance. Dudenak. That was excellent. The link I put in the show notes again is the black worm of Brandsford. If you uh, if you like these videos, if you want to give me a thumbs up, that helps me out a lot. Also, if you want to subscribe, I don't bother you much. You know, you'll just there's also that bell if you want to get immediately notified when I put out my new material. But otherwise, you'll just get notified when I put out new videos. I stream just about every workday, uh, with a few exceptions here or there, and I will periodically upload other videos talking about stuff. Usually it's OSR stuff, usually from the DM's perspective, but I'll touch on other things as well. If you know of an adventure module, other kind of uh, supplement or, or rule book that you think I might enjoy, or think you might enjoy watching or listening to me go on about, then send it to me or send, send me, a, send me the name, send me a link to where I can find it. And I'll try to get a hold of it. That's all I got for now. Game on, everybody. Have the great rest of your day, night, whenever you're watching or listening to this. Cheers, peace, and I'll talk to you later.